Hey, it's Pastor Mike. If you enjoy listening to this podcast and make it a regular part of your day, can I ask for your regular support? We really can't make any of our sermon series or devotions without the continual support of friends like you. Time of Grace, in case you didn't know, is 100% donor-funded, meaning it is your gifts that make it possible for us to use television and print and digital media to share the good news of God's amazing grace. Just click on the link in the episode notes, and thank you for all of your prayers and all of your support. God bless. Is wearing makeup a sin? <laughs> what a short and dangerous question. All right, um, can, can I tell you a secret? You promise not to tell anyone? <laughs> so, because our ministry uh, films for television, we have like some pretty intense lights when I'm up in front of God's people on a Sunday. And, and that's why before church begins, I, I duck into the little producer's production suite and I have makeup put on. Not a lot, okay, in my defense. I'm not <laughs> blessing on, <laughs> on Rouge. Just a little bit to take the, the shine off of my face <laughs> as I'm standing in front of God's people under those bright lights. Um, <laughs> but I have a hunch that that's not the question. You're not probably talking about a high school theater performance or a Hollywood set or filming something for TV. I'm, I'm guessing you're thinking, you know, all this uh, time and money we put into making ourselves look a little bit different than we actually are. Is that a sin? I mean, the Bible speaks about vanity and being self-absorbed. So can we say that that's what makeup is? God made you like this. He made your skin like this. He made your hair like this. He made your eyes like this. But now you're doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J to look like that, something that you really aren't. I heard a woman say, I have to put on my face. <laughs> Ladies, is that a, do you say that often? <laughs> no, you, you already have a, a face. But for her, um, it was a different looking face. So it's actually an interesting question. Is wearing makeup a sin? Is it vanity or is it um, some connection to beauty? I actually think the question is related to a whole bunch of questions like fashion. Is it okay? I mean, God... God didn't create your body with clothes. We put clothes on top of it. Is it okay to wear clothes that make you look better, that are flattering to your figure? If you're, you know, wearing vertical stripes or, or wearing black or you have a, a slim fit shirt like I'm wearing right now because I'm uh, kind of a slim guy, is, is it okay to buy the shoes or wear the jewelry? Is it okay to, to comb your hair, to cut your hair? God didn't make it like that. So we're, we're adjusting our body and our appearance all the time in all kinds of ways. Every time I shave or, or comb my hair, put on glasses, put on pants, I'm adjusting the body that God gave me. Is that good or bad? <laughs> well, the question is more complex than you thought, right? I would say this. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, um, the Apostle Paul is speaking to young pastor Timothy. Um, he's pastoring this uh, church in a big city called Ephesus. And and Paul says this, I want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Um, so there's the warning on the one side, um, that a woman's beauty should not be her hairstyle or her jewelry or her fashion or her fit. No, what makes a woman beautiful, what makes any of us beautiful, should be the good deeds that are appropriate for those of us who worship God. Um, when God is the focus of our life, um, we're not worried about all the attention on us. Sometimes, for some of us, our passion for fashion is a sign of sin. Is that we want all the attention. Like, we, if we don't look good and walk into a room, it, like, drives us, we, we can't stand it because we're living for that affirmation, our, our physical beauty. There's a real danger. The Bible calls it vanity, which focuses the attention away from God and onto us. Where if I look good and the makeup's just right, even if I'm impatient or unkind and a gossip, I feel good about myself because of the outward appearance. And Paul says, no, I don't want that. I want women 
to clothe themselves with good deeds that are appropriate for those who profess to worship God. And so we, we do need to be careful. If we spend too much time, too much money, if just too much of our joy is put into this outward appearance and too little is connected to our faith and the joy of Jesus and the good deeds that are appropriate, well, that certainly is a red flag. And, <laughs> and here's the tension. We have to be careful that we don't add rules to the Bible. Um, is makeup in and of itself a sin? It's no more sinful than getting a haircut or uh, shaving this morning. So I wasn't all scruffy for these videos. It, it's no more sinful uh, than adorning ourselves on a wedding day um, to look beautiful. B beauty is not a problem with God. In fact, when you get to the very end of the Bible, when heaven is coming down to earth in Revelation chapter 21, do you know what it says about God's people? It says, then I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I believe the Greek word there is connected to the word cosmetic. Just like a bride has been cosmeticed. <laughs> Just like, like we've made her as flattering and beautiful as she can be for that big day. That's how God's people will be on the last day. So are cosmetics sinful? They are not. Is dressing beautiful on your wedding day a bad thing? Is it pure vanity? It, it doesn't have to be. These are matters of the heart and that's why they're tricky. Uh, someone might put on makeup, comb their hair, buy new clothes, um, just a, as a way to look beautiful, to bring joy to others. Other people might do it out of pure vanity. And so we have to be careful not to jump to any conclusion, but instead to get to know that person, whether they're covered in makeup or have none on at all to get to the heart of the issue because it is really an issue of the heart. Is it sinful to wear makeup? My biblical answer is maybe. If you're gay, how do you manage your need for sex and community? Are you meant to be entirely alone? That's the very raw question that someone uh, recently asked me during our church's question and answer Sunday. If, if I'm gay, if, if this is who I am, if I can't flip a switch and be straight, but I still have this need for marriage, to, to be a parent, for sexual intimacy, for that companionship and community of a, a relationship, what does God, does God seriously just want me to be alone? Does he want me to deny those very needs? Now, as a straight guy, I'm not sure that I can totally just grasp the, the depth of that question, but I, I kind of think of my own life. If I wasn't, if I wasn't a father to Brooklyn and Maya, and if I couldn't change my sexual desires and, and I didn't have that intimacy with Kim, if I didn't go home to her as my spouse, and if we couldn't express all the companionship of love, the, the sexual part of it, like what, could I be okay with life? Could, could I live with suppressing those needs? It's a really important question. Uh, let me grab my Bible then and, and give a few answers. So, you know, I have to kind of start, I think this question comes from the belief that, well, doesn't the Bible say that same-sex relationships are bad? It's a huge question. It, it's really not fair of me to answer such a personal question for many of you with a just a one-line answer. Um, we've actually written entire books about this called Gay and God. You might want to track that down. Uh, you might want to study Romans chapter 1 through 3 or 1 Corinthians chapter 6 or 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, that has led many Christians, including myself, to the conclusion that God does not approve of same-sex relationships or behavior. Um, so if we assume that's true, this question is, is really relevant. Well, if God doesn't somehow like do a miracle and change my desires, then for the next 5, 10, 50, 80 years, I'm not going to live with the blessings that other people have, things that I feel like I need. What do we say to that? As brothers and sisters in Jesus, knowing that we have many people uh, in our family and in our church family who are in that situation, what would we, what would we say to them? Um, we can say a bunch of things to them. Uh, here's the first thing. Everyone has to wait. I think what I, I want to shift in your way of thinking is that this is a need. Um, 
you need to breathe, right? Like you die without breath, but we, we'd have to admit that you don't die without sex. Uh, in fact, everyone waits. I think of a husband who would love to be intimate with his wife, but, um, you know, she's just not in the mood or um, she's away on business or things are crazy. He has to, he has to wait. He doesn't need it in this moment. Or uh, think of a dating couple. Maybe they're looking forward to sexual intimacy, but it's not going to be for six months or 12 months or two years or four years. So they have to wait. So sex is something they might desire and want, but they don't need it to survive. Um, they don't need, they can have good days without sex, obviously. So I just want to save you from that deceptive thought that you can't have a good day today unless you have a spouse or sexual intimacy or children to come home to. That, that's simply not true. Everyone, for little bits or medium bits or really, really long bits, has to wait. And I also say this, you are not meant to be alone because God provides community in so many ways. But the community and companionship of marriage is amazing, without a doubt. I can tell that you long for it. But we can say that, that many people who are not married, many single people, they don't live alone. They have robust friendships, great connections to their communities, to their parents, their siblings, their friends, and their churches. You're right. In Genesis 2, it says it's not good for the man to be alone. And the Apostle Paul, who was single, you should read the New Testament, all the names of all the people that he mentioned, that he did life with, they weren't his sexual partners, none of them were uh, his wife, and yet, this man lived in a robust community, and you can too. And I know it's not exactly the same as marriage, but so much of the joy, the companionship, the communication, the sharings of the highs and lows of your day, that, that can happen in really great friendships and church communities too. I hope that you pursue it. More than anything, I want to leave you today with these words. Um, they're the words that inspired me to become a pastor. Uh, back when I was a high schooler, planning on studying business, uh, going to UW-Madison to study like my dad and my brother did, I came across these words and they changed the trajectory of my life. They inspired me so much and I think they are perfect for this question. It's Jesus speaking. He said this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I think your question gets to the heart of this, that there's a cross to carry to be biblical, to follow Jesus. You can't just do what you want, love who you want, and have sex with whomever you want. There is a cost to obedience and holiness, and Jesus himself knows it. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny that part of you. You must take up a cross. It's not going to be comfortable and follow me. Don't miss that last part. Because when we repent of our sins, we get to be with Jesus. That's why he continues, verse 35, for whoever wants to save their life, like hold on to our desires, you will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Whatever you give up for Jesus is worth it. Whatever money or time, whatever sexual passion and connection, whatever you would get out of being a parent or being a spouse, those things might be good, but they are, believe me, they are so nothing compared to Jesus. I want to encourage you, if you have a chance, to read this little book. It's called A Change of Affection by Beckett Cook. Uh, Beckett was a, a gay man who had no love for the Christian faith until God got a hold of him. He tells a story in this book uh, where he ends up in a church where the word of God is preached and where he denies himself, takes up his cross, and follows Jesus with joy. And I love in, in the story, he, he's recognizing, like, people are saying, well, how much are you going to lose if you follow Jesus? And, and his quote is, is this. Let, let me read it to you. Beckett says, surprisingly, I was perfectly fine with this realization. The complete reversal of my opinions and pursuits worked like this. I had just met the king of the universe. The last thing on my mind was men. To say that every other relationship paled in comparison with my new relationship with Christ would be a massive understatement. How could I hold on to anything that didn't bring me closer to Jesus? Please 
do not see Christianity as a losing game. You will lose some of those things that you desired. You, you mentioned them and they are real. But in Jesus, you gain life, life with God, life that lasts forever, peace and comfort, and, and a home in heaven. It's absolutely worth it. Jesus is a treasure. I, I pray, like Becca Cook discovered, you see that, you believe that, and it inspires you to live according to it. Is it a sin for a soldier to murder? Someone posed that question the other day. If uh, someone is fighting in a war for their country and they take another person's life, is, is that wrong in the eyes of God? Is that breaking the commandment, you shall not murder? Um, well, that's uh, a deep question. Um, it, it goes back to the idea that God has established authority in this world. Um, our parents are the most obvious example, but the government. And the government's job is to promote justice by defending the innocent and punishing the guilty. I think of a famous passage like Romans chapter 13. Um, it, it says this. The one in authority is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. God's servants. Uh, those who are serving the government are actually God's servants and they have a sword in their hands <clears throat> and here's their job to make people who do wrong be afraid. Now, if you think about it, a sword was not used to slap someone on the back of the hand. Um, a sword in the days of the Roman Empire was used for much more serious things, for, for piercing, for ending someone's life. Now, the question is, does that same principle apply when we're talking about a soldier serving a broader government? And, and the biblical answer is, it depends. This is connected to what St. Augustine, uh, a Christian from about 1600 years ago, called just war theory. That if our country is trying to punish those who do wrong and defend those who do good, if innocent people are being attacked, then for a government to protect them would absolutely be just. It would be right. It's like if, if someone came running into my home with a weapon to hurt my family, for me to hurt that person would be a good and godly thing. I'm protecting those that God has put in my care. That would be just. That would not be sin. That would not be breaking the commandment to not murder. Instead, it would actually be protecting life by going after the one who wants to take life. So if you're a soldier, if you're a veteran, and you're, you're fighting against the cause of evil, if people are attacking the innocent. It is right for us to step in and protect them. It is right for a police officer or a soldier, a general, or a government who has been given the sword by God to make those who do wrong be afraid. Now, for police officers in the line of duty, for soldiers who are fighting in a war, this, this raises a whole bunch of questions of what is just, um, who is dangerous. These are deep uh, nuanced questions I don't have time to get into today, but I, I can say this. Um, it is not inherently wrong for a soldier to take another person's life. A soldier and a government can actually be God's servants who protect the greater gift of life. You can be pro every life as you end someone else's life and Romans 13 explains why. So here's some homework for you. I'd encourage you to look up just war theory. Uh, figure out what wars would be greedy and sinful and selfish and murderous. And which ones a country might enter into because they're God's servants and they love justice. That distinction is vital for countries and for the soldiers who serve them. What does God think of Elon Musk's goal of interplanetary habitation? Well, that's a question a pastor doesn't get every Sunday. <laughs> But the other Sunday, I got that question. Pastor, what does, what does God, what does his word say about Elon Musk, who has this goal of humans inhabiting places other than Earth? I got to admit, I've been a pastor for a lot of years and I've never thought about the desires of Elon Musk's heart. 
But I actually just finished reading that big new biography about Elon Musk, what, six, 700 pages, I think. So I learned a lot about his passion that this world, um, it, it's ticking down. And so it's just essential, in his opinion, that we humans find other places to live. He has this passion to go to Mars, if you know much about Elon Musk. So what do, what do we think of that? It might be connected to questions like, what about space exploration? What about NASA? What about getting to the moon? What about all these rockets and, and satellites? What about beyond Earth's atmosphere? What does the Bible say about that? Let me give you um, two concepts to keep in mind as we think about such ideas. Um, one is that it's not just Earth that declares the glory of God. Like, if you, if you want to get excited about God, to think of him as, as God, glorious, magnificent, exalted, and magnified, earth can do that in a lot of ways. The whole earth is filled with the glory of God, but it's not just earth. I love Psalm 19. It says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of of God's hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. It says, this, in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is deprived of its warmth. So the psalmist here, this is David speaking, uh, he thinks about the sun, what's out in space, what's beyond planet earth, as something that's preaching to us, pouring forth speech. And what does it do? It declares the glory of God and the work of his hands. Now, i got to say, uh, I don't know a ton about space and other planets, but when I just hear about the vastness of everything, and then I think that my God made that with a word. <laughs> I love uh, Genesis chapter 1, you know, God's creating everything. And there's this little line, it's so funny. It says, and he made the stars. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but then you study the stars, you study the sun, you study what's beyond the clouds, and you think, Whoa, God made that as like an afterthought. He, he just like spoke and it came into existence. I mean, if, if the universe is this big, how big is the God who created the universe? And so, do I see a great and noble purpose for Christians to explore the soil of this earth and the skies beyond it without a doubt? It declares the bigness, the glory, and the magnificence of God. Now, second, I would disagree with this idea that we have to get to other planets because this world is going to end by some, you know, human climate catastrophe. Um, we do know from the teachings of Jesus and many passages in the New Testament that the world will not end like that. The world will actually end when Jesus comes back. And Jesus himself said on that day, uh, people won't be living on, on Mars. He said they'll be eating and drinking, marrying, being given in marriage. Like We'll still be right here on earth when our Savior Jesus Christ returns from the heavens. Now, I know Elon Musk is not a Christian. Um, he doesn't claim to follow the Bible, so I, I don't expect him to believe that. But I would say that the Christians, we know that the story of Earth doesn't end with World War III or a climate catastrophe. It ends with the return of Jesus, his second coming, which happens on the last day or the judgment day. So there's a tension here, right? I want to care for the Earth, I want to explore the universe to declare the glory of God, and we also know how the story ends when Jesus comes back to give us a whole new Earth, which is when the fun really begins. So what does God think of Elon Musk? I think those two things held in tension are the right biblical answer. Is pornography really that bad? <laughs> That's what someone uh, recently asked me at our church's question and answer Sunday. Um, this uh, person, I don't know who they are, said, uh, you know, they use porn. Everyone talks about it in the church, like it's such a bad thing and it's going to cause so many problems. But this questioner said it really hasn't. <laughs> My life hasn't imploded because of pornography. And so they asked um, the short but important question, what makes it so bad? Hasn't been my experience. What, what makes it so bad? Well, before I open my Bible and give you a few things to think about, um, sometimes something is bad even before you've felt the consequence of it. For example, 
Uh, a person could drive drunk 10 times and make it home safely and asked, what's so bad? Everyone says, don't drive drunk. Don't drive drunk. I've done it 10 straight times and no, nothing happened. Look at me. I'm just fine. Everyone's fine. So just because the consequence hasn't happened yet, that doesn't mean the thing itself isn't bad. Um, or think about texting and driving, right? Same kind of concept. I'm, I don't wear my seatbelt. <laughs> I'm a little bit high off this joint I just smoked. I'm driving with my knees and I'm texting with both thumbs. And look, my car hasn't gotten totaled yet. It's not bad. You see what I'm getting at? Like just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't happen. Just because you haven't felt the consequence yet doesn't mean there isn't a consequence. So I just want to challenge that way of thinking um, that we, we trust that what God says is bad actually is, even if the consequence hasn't come just yet. Okay, so according to God, why exactly is pornography bad? I mean, pornography can be a release. It can be excitement in the middle of boredom. Um, it can be a way to escape the difficulties of the day. And if you're not hurting anyone, it's not like illegal kind of stuff, well, someone might uh, ask, well, what's so bad about that? Here's what. A pornography is harmful to you. A pornography... <laughs> I mean, the way that God designed our bodies sexually with chemicals like dopamine and oxytocin and epinephrine, when we engage in pornography, and especially when we connect masturbation to that, there's a massive chemical thing that's happening in our body that's actually gluing us to pornography. Um, internet pornography is one of the most addictive substances there is because of what's happening chemically in your brain. And so what you're doing, the more and more you use that, is you are, you're bonding your brain to need pornography. Like you're gluing your body to something it feels like you can't live without. And if you don't believe me, I would say this, just stop. Right? If you're not hooked, Go the next 90 days without a single look at porn. You, you might find that your body has become addicted to it. You've been mastered by it. it. It's bad for you. And I would say it's probably bad for future you. Because maybe you're single right now. Maybe it's not hurting anyone because you don't have a partner to hurt. But I can tell you this. After having sat uh, in that tear-filled conversation with lots of people, if, if you're dating someone or married to someone and they, they see that you're not satisfied with them, that instead of their body being attracted to you, you're attracted to all these other, I, I can guarantee you that will do incredible damage to their spirit and to your relationship. And so if you don't, if you don't fight pornography right now, you know, maybe it's not hurting you right now, but it will hurt you and them very soon. Um, we could talk a ton about what pornography is behind the scenes, what it does to the people who act in it, direct it, are involved in it. We could talk about sex trafficking, all the things they don't tell you before they put that video up on that website. But pornography damages so many people in so many ways. And this is why God says this to you and to me. First Corinthians chapter 6, flee from sexual immorality. God, God isn't saying, well, just don't. Don't click. Just stay there and resist it. No, he says, run from it. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Listen, if your grandma walked into the room, I, I bet I bet your conscience would know this isn't good. And if Jesus walked into the room, and he is in the room, man, we should know that this, this isn't right. It might feel harmless, but I, I think we know deep down this is not the will of God. So honor God with your body by fleeing from sexual immorality. Um, th this is a sin that Jesus can and did forgive at the cross. Confess it to him. He is faithful. He, he will wipe this sin away. Run to a, a counselor, a, a pastor, a trusted friend. Confess this sin and get help. Go to a website like conquersthroughchrist.net and find all kinds of resources and encouragement and gospel grace that you need most as you fight this sin. It might seem harmless, but I guarantee you it is not because the word of God says that it is not. Flee from it. You were not your own. You were bought at a price, the price of Jesus. Therefore, honor God with your bodies.